Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Jeff Maurer. He's a writer, comedian, and five-time Emmy Award winner. He's also won two Peabody Awards, five Writer Guilds Awards, and four Television Critics Association Awards. He was one of the original writers of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, where he was promoted to senior writer. He left the show to write a political comedy substack called I Might Be Wrong, which is the title of his podcast and his regular substack column. So in the show notes, you can just click on those links to those directly in which he covers politics and economics and culture and society with a comedic voice. He's a funny guy. Instead of trying to interpret the world from a single viewpoint, Jeff picks apart the thinking behind the viewpoints and digs deep into policy. So we will provide the rest of his bio below. I just want to um, uh, just make a comment that uh, in 2022 and going forward, I want to branch out for the podcast and talk to, let's just say, regular people, (laughs) real people. I'm mostly talking to uh, academic uh, scientists and historians, philosophers, economists, political scientists, and so on, authors of new books. I'd like to talk to people that um, are outside of that realm, just to get a, a, a contact with the real world, let's say. And Jeff is certainly one of those. He is a professional comedian, and he did write uh, as you know the lead writer for uh, John Oliver's show. And so we get into talking about that, how best to communicate not just science, but any kind of factual information, history, philosophy, economics, politics to uh, the public. How do you do that? And in fact, he worked for the EPA for eight years, uh, writing speeches and writing, you know, white papers and public statements from um, the Environmental Protection Agency. And, and that taught him a lot about how to communicate science and factual information uh, in a in a way that's acceptable to people. So how do you do that? And how do you write comedy? And, and what makes something funny and not? So we get into talking about creativity, how the sausages are made in these shows. How do they? How do these shows work behind the scenes? And, and when he was there, there were eight comedians or eight writers working behind the scenes, writing these jokes, and but also doing all this research on these deep dive subjects in which, uh, starting with the Jon Stewart show, present the news as a form of comedy. And in fact, as it turned out, a lot of people ended up getting their news from those kinds of shows rather than the mainstream media uh, news outlets. So that has changed the media landscape. And so we talk about that. Then we just do a lot of riffing on related subjects, particularly conspiracies and conspiracy theories and social media and to what extent uh, they should be responsible for the proliferation of uh, um, conspiracy theories. And, you know, how do you regulate someone like an Alex Jones? Well, we agree that you can't really do that in any way that, that doesn't then discriminate against other people that maybe have a good point and so on. So it's a nice w- wide ranging um, conversation on a lot of what I think are important topics in current events and going forward. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation uh, with Jeff. And if you support the podcast, please do give us some love at skeptic.com slash donate, which is the primary uh, supporter of the podcast. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, so your donations are tax deductible. Supports not only the podcast, but my my own Substack skeptic column and the magazine and everything else that we, we do at the Society to promote science and rationality and critical thinking. So thanks for your support, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Kind of give us a how the sausages are made on these TV shows. You know, you watch a John Oliver, and he launches into this 20-minute uh, deep dive, what feels like a deep dive, with tons of statistics and numbers and graphs, video clips, and I just think there must be a team of people doing this. He can't be doing this. So how many people work at that, yeah. and how, how does it? How do you, you like pick a subject, and then you have a week to, to, to make it happen? Yeah, well, luckily, we have more than a week because we start them well in advance. Um, it, it, the exception would be if something happened that week. For example, when the uh, Mueller report came out, we did that came out on like a Tuesday or something, I think. It was just right for us because we air on Sundays, um, just right for us to rush out a piece in one week. But more typically, uh, we start a couple weeks or even more than a month out. Um, pitches come mostly from the writers, but also from the researchers and then also from the production staff. There are usually, well, when I was there, it was eight writers, 
It's now 12. Eight. Whoa. Yeah, eight. Um, That's it, a pretty it, big it, the, payroll. About eight. Wow. We, went, we went up to... It, it is a pretty good payroll. <laughs> in, in, in television nowadays, if you know the trends of television, the trend is towards smaller and smaller and smarter, smaller writer, writer's rooms. I said smarter. I wish that was true. It may or may not be true. <laughs> but certainly smaller rooms are true. Um, we had typically eight. It went up to nine or ten at some points. But eight writers. We usually had about four researchers. That, also, that went up to five by the time I left. And um, four... Uh, production. Uh, I forget what their title is. Production people, and then many other production people beneath them. So the pitches typically typically came from the writers, but it could also come from a producer or a researcher. It could come from John himself, or from our executive producer Tim Carvel, who is sort of the John Oliver behind the camera, who you never see. Tim plays a very big role in the show, and there are, those pitches happen all the time they're sort of just kind of constantly churning in the ether there there's an excel sheet of all pitches at all times and one might be kind of something we sort of want to do and then something happens in the news and that causes john to say okay this one now so a couple weeks out a premise is picked a researcher starts working on it and the the setup is usually a researcher a producer and two writers so those four as as well as some support people um, basically start working on it and you, the producer's main job is to find clips. The researcher's main job is to obviously do the research, figure out, you know, what people are saying, uh, what things we might need to know if there's, you know, the, the digging up of something that's always kind of fun when we get to sort of, uh, <laughs> I kind of think of it as a little kid, like dressing up like a journalist for Halloween. We sort of get to do that and pretend like we're, we're serious journalists here, dig up something <laughs> that we reveal on the show. Uh, and then, so the, the the writers write drafts, and then there's a second draft, and blah 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 blah. Eventually, you've got something approaching the final draft, and then in that last like two or three days, the draft really comes together because you found all the clips at that point. But the draft it gets cut down, it gets reshaped if it needs to, and then at the very end, all of the writers, not just the two who had been working on it, all the writers come in and pitch jokes and punch it up in various ways. And that, that really happens in the last like two or three days usually, and then uh, rehearsal and air on Sunday. Wow, that's incredible. And you've still truncated it a lot. I mean, John Oliver has a lot of jokes in there, and I guess you know he must have developed that when he worked for John Stewart, right? He was one of his correspondents. That's how he got his start. And John Stewart kind of pioneered yeah. that. I'm going to give you the news, but with, with humor. And it turned out, as far as I know from these polls, is that a lot of people, what, age 15 to 30 or so, that's where they got their news with John Stewart. And then John Oliver, yeah. or, or sorry. Yeah. No, am I thinking? Yeah. No, it was, no, 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 it's, it wasn't. It's uh, confusing. They shouldn't both be named John. You shouldn't be allowed yes, to have two right. Johns. I, I think, <laughs> right. I think Oliver should have had to change his name because John <laughs> Stewart right. was first. So he needs <laughs> to be right. Billy Oliver yeah. or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, that's funny. But yeah, uh, it, it, John, John Stewart it, did. Uh, oh, I, I just want to say quickly, uh, sometimes you'll hear people call this the John Stewart universe of shows when they're talking about Last Week Tonight or Full Frontal with Sam B or The Daily Show now under Trevor Noah. That's all the John Stewart universe of shows because he really did pioneer this format of clip joke, clip joke. He pioneered, pioneered the format and then also pioneered the part of having an actual opinion because it's opinion journalism, isn't it? It was different than the Johnny Carson thing where he would do jokes about the news, but you, there wasn't really an opinion in it. So yes, all of that traces back to Jon Stewart. He did kind of invent this genre. And would you say that, that in that universe, it, it is left-leaning? They, they make fun of uh, oh, more God, Republicans yes. than Democrats? Yeah, okay. God, God <laughs> yes. Michael, Michael. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear you confess <laughs> that. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, let me unpack that a little bit. It's it's yeah, not a, it's not a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. It's just kind of how these things shake out. Because think of like where you're drawing from. Okay, think of like who ends up populating the writers' room in one of these shows, or really pretty much for any late night show. Okay, first of all, you're young, probably in your twenties or thirties. That that's a group that skews to the left. Uh, you're also kind of artsy because you're you're a comedian or you came from improv or something. Improv is like. If you're, you know, a Trotskyist, you're like in the center of the bell curve in the improv <laughs> oh my world. God. So that's, I, I, that's hyperbole, but not by a ton. Um, 
So you're drawing from the sort of artsy, kind of performy kind of community. That's a left-leaning group. They're in a major city. Oh, you're in a major city. That's a left-leaning group. You're uh, probably highly educated. Almost everybody went to... I, I, I literally don't know a comedy writer in this world who didn't at least go to college. And very many of them went to sort of fancy pants colleges. So there's another left-leaning group. When you combine all these left-leaning groups, it's like, yeah, if you were to map the distribution on the political spectrum of where most writers exist, I'm definitely on like the the right-ish edge of that. And like I said, I'm a I call myself an Obama liberal. So y- is it left-leaning? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It really is. Right, because Carson used to make fun of all presidents and all whoever whoever candidates or politicians were in the news didn't really matter left or right. So that definitely changed, and it's clear why. In your conversations, do you have any any uh, input like, hey, we've just told twenty seven straight jokes about c- conservatives and Republicans. <laughs> we better we better throw one in making fun of you know a, a Democrat or something like that. Yeah, yes, you're actually uh, get, getting to a thing that I think is worth talking about because I think it's a, a kind of major problem with that world. Making fun of Democrats? Oh, we'll make fun of Democrats. That's that's no problem. The, the left-leaning shows, if you watch them, it's not too hard to find jokes about Democrats, jokes about Biden. How hard-hitting are they? Uh, you can you know, make a plausible case that, you know, they go easier on the Democrats, certainly. Um, I feel like the loyalty, the loyalty is not really to the Democratic Party. There's actually, there's like a bit of a badge of honor of like, we'll go after Biden, we'll take on Biden. I mean, it's like, I mean, I I left before Biden was elected. But yeah, we would, we would do that. I, I mean, when I started, Obama was still president, we'd make fun of Obama, we'd make fun of Hillary Clinton. That's no problem. Again, you can certainly argue that we went easier on, you know, Hillary than we did on Trump, I would point out Trump is Trump. <laughs> I would point out that a, uh, you know, a, an objective attempt to point out each candidate foibles is going to lean a hell of a hot, lot uh, more heavily on Trump than it is on Hillary. So, but there is a, there's sort of a badge of honor of like, we'll go after Democrats. So I don't think that's a problem, but you may notice whenever these shows go after Democrats, they tend to go at them from the left. And that's the, that's the perspective problem that did come to bother me as I was there for many years. We, I was there for six years. We did about 200 shows. That's more than 500 segments because it's, that's At lot. least to a show, and in the early days, we might have like three or four. It's a lot of segments, and then within a segment, there are a lot of beats. You know, a beat is like a clip and a joke. I don't think we ever did a segment that departed from what you might call the like approved lefty talking points, and that did bother me. Um, I know that we never talked, for example, GMOs for years and years and years. I was pitching a show about GMOs, because I thought that would be an example, uh, that would be a, a case where we could break from the typical liberal lefting talking points. It never happened. I mean, sh- you pitch stuff all the time and it doesn't happen. So the fact that it didn't happen isn't a conspiracy theory or anything, but we did never do that. We did never do nuclear power, which I thought was another example, because I'm, I'm a yeah, big climate yeah. change guy because of my EPA background. So I thought it would be worth saying, hey, by the way, nuclear power should be something we're at least considering. Didn't make it again. The fact that it didn't make it, maybe it just wasn't an inter- interesting enough piece. I don't know. But I do know that we did 500-something segments, and none of them really deviated from those liberal left talking points. And that really did come to bother me uh, over the years. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, because even the segments you choose, like you're going to talk about uh, health care reform or prison reform or police reform or whatever, there's going to be a slant on it, even if you're not making fun of a particular person. It's probably subtle enough that it's not super obvious to viewers, but it's there. Uh, I can't think of any uh, with the John Oliver show, but 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 I, I've been impressed with a lot of the deep dives they do. Um, by the way, how do you know what's funny? You know, he'll he'll be going along, and then all of a sudden, this is yeah. like I'm just making this up. J- uh, Justin Bieber doing something. It's like this has nothing to do with what oh, he's talking yeah. about, and it's funny. <laughs> but do you have like six of those, and you try one out, and that's the funny one. And the other ones were not that funny. 
Uh, well, yes, in that the the jokes written to jokes aired ratio at last week tonight is about thirty to one. People are usually oh my God. really, uh, yeah. People wow. are, that's usually the reaction that uh, people have. I did actually start keeping loose track of this while I was there. What is about the ratio? It's it's in the neighborhood of thirty to one. Um, you, wow. you just write tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of jokes. Um, does that mean that the one that airs is funny? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, go to war behind every joke that I ever wrote on the show. Um, but it, you, you are often... So sometimes you get something that's inherently funny, which is fantastic. Uh, that's honestly, it's like that's part of the reason Trump keeps showing up back when he was president. The guy's funny. He's funny and he does he ridiculous funny. stuff. And he you does. have to actually keep yourself from just making the show all Trump because he's so stupid and he's so funny and i i can't describe to you how much easier it is to write a joke off of donald trump saying something stupid than it is to write a joke off of a you know a, an economist saying oh over the last five years that is uh reduced by 15 percent there's nothing to write off that 15 percent joke honestly that's where you, that's where you get the justin bieber jokes we, we often call those left turn jokes because you have to take the the comment about reduced by 15% and then kind of left left turn it into uh, the only thing that's reduced by 15% is Justin Bieber's chest hair over the last 3 years like that's the best you can do <laughs> right. with that right right that's funny honestly that's if, you, he, if, you're, you just... if you're if <laughs> you're not not well thank you thank you i thought it was a real b minus but you know what sometimes in comedy a b minus is right. good enough i, I will tell so, you if you if you really <laughs> i don't mean to give away all the trade secrets but if you see a, a segment in which there's a bunch of that's like jokes one after another after another that means we were probably kind of scrambling we were kind of probably kind of stretching to find something funny i like that 31 ratio this does support the kind of the academic research on creativity that it's a very darwinian process there's uh you know most creators just produce a ton of content and then it gets whittled down by themselves and then there are people around them and then eventually the marketplace and what's left standing is the really golden stuff, but and, and we just don't see all the crap that was there. You know, Mozart, you know, was <laughs> you know he was composing at age four and playing at age three or whatever. His father was a musician. You know, by the time we get yeah. the, the 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 refined stuff, we don't see the whatever it is ten thousand hours before that or the ten thousand items he produced that were just crap. Uh, I was thinking about that watching hey, the, I, the the new uh, the new Beatles documentary. Um, the Beatles documentary. I yeah. <laughs> You know, there's just mostly they're just just shooting the shit, talking, joking around, and then they play a little bit, and it sounds crappy, and then they refine it, it sounds a little better, and you go. So this is how it's done. It's it's wow. Yeah. There there's this clip that went around online of Paul McCartney writing "Get Back," and mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll bet yeah, a lot of your that. listeners have seen this. He's just kind of yeah, he's just kind of um, screwing around with the bass, kind of trying different things, and then suddenly just kind of get back falls out and uh it uh, my first thought when i when i saw that was oh okay so that that's kind of it that's kind of the process and then my second thought was well i think that's the process if you're paul mccartney <laughs> i'm not <laughs> right. sure yes right i'm not right. sure that yeah, you I and i are not follow the that. same rules yeah <laughs> right 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 yeah. yeah this is like the thing where you know einstein had a dream about riding on a beam of light and Next thing you know, we have general theory, uh, general relativity theories. Like, yeah, but if I have that dream, yeah. we're not getting some grand right. theory of the universe. <laughs> yeah, fuck him. Fuck you, Einstein. Come on. <laughs> I need some I need some usable process, something that works for me. Don't get I wrote I woke up with it because I'm Einstein. What am I supposed to do with it? Right. By the way, That's right. I like the idea of a Mozart's Mozart Mozart B sides album would be fantastic. Mm. I, I would, yes, I would right. love that. Just to knock right. him down a peg. Right. So you could be like, right. oh, you know, it's like not very good. And you're like, oh, Mozart kind of sucked sometimes. <laughs> Makes me feel That's better right. about myself. But it's that sort of muses theory of genius and creativity that just, just pops in like a light bulb out of nowhere. There's no background to it. And that just really never happens. God, I, I, oh, I, I really hope that's not true. Because if that is true, <laughs> then I'm an idiot. Because <laughs> that never happens me to me. <laughs> and remember, anything remember I've ever the... done... <laughs> I went to see uh, Jay Leno once at this comedy club in Redondo Beach. I think it was. Might might have been Manhattan Beach. But anyway, apparently he had some contract way back when that he would appear every Sunday night at this club. So he did. You know, it was just 
there was no cover charge except he had to buy two drinks. And there he is. There's Jay Leno. He's 10 feet away. And he came out with this stack of index cards and he starts going through these. And, you know, he would just, and, and then based on our response, he would sort them out. And then, so I watched the tonight show the yeah. next night. It's like, Oh, Oh, that was one of the ones we heard last night. You know? So it, that was kind of that Darwinian process. I'll try mm -hmm. it out here on these 50 people in this little room and see how it goes. And then we'll see what makes the cut. Absolutely. Oh, and stand up is extremely that way. And I, you know, I was a stand up for 15 years before I, COVID, uh, Killed that. I'll probably go back eventually, but COVID kind of ended that for me for right now. But yeah, 15 years of stand up, I never developed a highly honed instinct for what was going to work and what was not going to work. I never, I never did it. You'd think you'd be able, I think I got better at it, but I never got good. You'd think you'd get good at that. You'd think you would basically know, okay, this is going to work. Uh, maybe some people do, but I sure didn't. And it's <laughs> from what you're telling me, it sounds like maybe Jay Leno. Didn't and there's a guy who told some jokes in his lifetime. Um, <laughs> yeah. It really is the case that you just have to take it to an audience, and they will tell you if they like it or not. Yeah, I saw the same thing with uh, George Carlin. Saw him in Vegas live, and he started off with his great riff on language and words and all that. And then right in the middle of the show, he went off on some sidetrack. I can't remember what it was like his dog or something at home, and and like five minutes into this, he just stops because it wasn't funny. He goes, okay, never mind." And then he just goes off back into the routine. I'm like, oh, okay. So hmm, this yeah. is how it works. You just try shit and see what happens. And well, okay, that's not working. So that's out. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it really is. And, and different things work in front of different crowds. I, you talk about a comic telling a five minute story. I remember the very first time I featured. So a feature is like 20, 25 minutes. The first time I featured I only had like 20, 25 minutes. So every all the material I had, that was going in the act. And I remember part of that was a story that was about five minutes long. And I got in the beginning of that story and the crowd was like, we're not interested in this. But I remember thinking, I have nowhere to go from here. You're, you're going to get every word of this five minute story because it's the only way I can get to 20. <laughs> That's why most, <laughs> most stand-ups... And you know, when you're George Carlin, the rules are different because you can just yeah, yeah. move from this thing to that thing. You're supposed to have to do 20 minutes. You're supposed to have 40 that way. <laughs> that mm. way, When you start down the path of a story, the audience has no interest in. You can shift gears instead of going all the way down the path and pissing everyone off. I have another funny story for you. I was on Bill Maher's show back in the 90s, the Politically Incorrect show. So he, the format was he sat between oh, sure. you know two people on one side and two people on the other side, so four guests total. And I was on with Julia Sweeney, and uh, well, I was on a couple times. One of them was Julia Sweeney, another one, uh, Kevin Nealon was the guy sitting next to me, the comedian from Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah, and he was mm -hmm. so funny and just spontaneous and impromptu and just coming up with you know these responses to things people were saying. I thought, damn, I wish I could be spontaneously funny like that. And then on the commercial break. He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out like these index cards and I could see, I kind of looked over, I could see, oh, th that was the line he just used. So he had like a little set of things and I'm going to wait and see what happens and then I'll pick one of these to throw in there. I thought, ah, so it's sort of prepared chaos mm -hmm. or I don't know what you'd call it. <laughs> Structured, yeah. impromptu, <laughs> uh, improv. Oh, so there that's you go. That's <laughs> how you're supposed to do it. Oh, yep. really? That's how you're supposed what, to what do was it. That? Yep. it. Was What was that? An index card, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's an index card. Yeah, no, I made some notes for this podcast. In case, just, okay. <laughs> just, just some ideas. Oh, some, that's uh, too funny. That's too funny. You're supposed to have, you, <laughs> it's, it's called having jokes in your pocket, and it sounds like Kevin Nealon oh, okay. had them literally in his pocket. Yeah. It literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that was a lesson yeah, to me, like, you're like, be, be prepared. It's all, yeah, yeah, be prepared. It's all it's all made up. It's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah, the, the trick, though, is to make it sound spontaneous, and it sounds like, Kevin Nealon, who is a hilarious yeah. guy, by the way, hilarious guy, oh, hilarious totally. stand-up. Yes. Sounds like he's. I was impressed. He he did. And then Can another I ask funny you story something? with it. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Oh go ahead. Oh well, well I was gonna say, I, since I'm just I, curious. I mentioned, uh, since I mentioned Julia Sweeney, let me just finish that that thread. Mm -hmm. So um, I met her on that show, and then we became friends. And she had this monologue about her uh, cancer. She had uterine cancer, and and then she started talking about uh, how she's becoming an atheist from being a Catholic. And, and I, you know, she had read Dawkins and Sam Harris and myself and others, Dan Dennett and whatnot. Anyway, so she was talking about how 
inspirational this was and 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 she wanted to do a monologue about it so i said well you should do that and you can try it out at caltech at our lecture series so she did and she came out and it was just a trial thing she had the notes and she was trying different things and so on and she had this funny story about like i was reading the new testament in light of what i know about you know reading atheist authors like you and sam harris and dawkins and so on so then i was talking to father whoever it was mckinney or something i'll just make that up and he told me, oh, don't worry about that. And, and so this, <laughs> this priest comes into the story at a certain point and so on. Then she refined the show and she had it recorded like for HBO or something. It's, it, and you can see it. It's called Letting Go of God. It's just a great show. And that particular story comes at a different time in her life with a different influence and might have even been a different priest. And I, and I remember asking her, well, wait a minute. I thought I remember that that guy came into the story over here. And she goes, it was funnier this way. I went, oh, Okay, so this is not a perfect timeline of your life. It's a rough outline of this is what I went through. And it's funnier if I tell it this way, and it's that guy instead of that guy, or it's at this place rather than this place in my life. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. You know, it's like based on a true story, <laughs> you know, roughly speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Rough yeah, roughly speaking. That that is how it works. I, I in my stand up for a long time I had a chunk about my dad it was like six or seven minutes worth of jokes about my dad it wasn't all about my dad it was like some things my dad done that dad had done and then some things maybe my mom did or my granddad and then a couple things that i did and then blamed on my dad uh so yeah it's it's like who's gonna who's gonna fact check you on that you know <laughs> yeah, i'm not right. gonna do a 60 minutes on how your stand-up routine isn't 100 percent true <laughs> uh so yeah right. i think you've got uh a lot of creative license to make it the funniest way that you you can but the the question right. I, I wanted oh, to yeah, ask if, if if you don't mind i'm just curious what the scientific and skeptic community feels about the popularizer for lack of a better term community so you know people like myself writing sub stacks about sometimes highly scientific issues in, in which we're not experts and then certainly you know the the nightly Political shows fall in the same category. Sometimes I get the feeling that there's a sense of, oh, cool, this thing that I've devoted my life to is now getting shared with a broader audience. Fantastic. It's so hard to get the word out about this, but this person has, you know, a platform where, like like you said, it's, you know, to get it on TV as opposed to a book or whatever, it's just a, a larger audience much more quickly. And then sometimes I get a sense of, uh, damn it, these idiots who don't know what they're talking about <laughs> are meddling in our area and talking about my field, but they're getting it all wrong. Do you have a sense of maybe which feeling is dominant or are both feelings there in equal amounts? I, just w what's your sense about that? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question because it, I think it, there's an element of truth to both of those um, responses that people have. Of course, it depends on who's responding. So if it's somebody that's actually a professional scientist and they're toiling away in the lab or in the astronomical dome or whatever, and they see someone like Bill Nye, the science guy, or Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, kind of uh, riffing on TV on, on The Tonight Show or the, or the John Oliver Show or whatever, mm -hmm. um, or The Colbert Report. And, 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 they're, and they're using this scientist's you know, findings and they're saying, well, you know, we've discovered this black hole or whatever. It's like, well, we, I mean, you know, the, the person in, <laughs> on TV had nothing to do with it. They're just kind Neil of Neil deGrasse Tyson personally the, discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I know Neil pretty well and, and Bill too. And, and, you know, they're both really good at what they do. And, and one of the problems critics have is they don't understand that that itself is a skill. That's hard to do. You know, hard to get on TV, say you, you got 30 seconds to respond to this, or you have to be ready. If the host says this, you're going to say that, like the Kevin Nealon thing. You have a kind of a list of prepared things to say. And I know both mm -hmm. Bill and, and Neil prepare that way. They're like, I'm ready to go for this, this, and this, and this. We'll see what happens. And they practice and, and, and think about it and they're, they're ready. Whereas the average, you know, academic egghead, you know, would just think, well, I'm just going to go on TV and talk about my, my findings or whatever, and I don't have to prep. And they, they think, well, anybody could do this. Well, no, actually they can't. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've seen both Bill and Neil enough to know, you know, I, I can't do that. I, I'm not funny like that, or I'm not quite as animated as Neil is, you know, and Bill, Bill is always funny. He is a really funny guy. You know, he got his start. He's doing very, stand -up. We had him on last week tonight. He's very funny. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. You guys did, uh, 
you did a thing on climate change, didn't you? Was that the one with the global warming? You had Bill and then a bunch of other people mm-hmm. in lab coats showing the support of we ha- of that was that now that was that's funny that that was we had Bill on twice, uh, and that was the first time we had him on, and that was one of the very 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 first things I wrote for last week tonight. And it's funny you said you know oh I write, you know I write a book and that reaches an audience, but if I get something on TV that reaches a much larger audience. We did that piece on climate change very early on. The, the premise was you tip, it, there are some news outlets, Fox News especially, that will sort of both sides the climate change debate where they will present it as if the scientific community is split 50-50 on the question of whether yes, climate right. change is real, whether climate change is happening, which of course is nowhere near 50-50. Um, but the joke, the joke that we had uh, was that it's always Bill Nye and then some anti-climate change dude having the debate on Fox News. It should be the anti-climate change dude versus, yes, like 100 scientists. So we had like 100 scientists <laughs> in lab coats run right, out. Right. That was, that was the great. Bit. And I remember, I remember coming in the uh, first day of work the week after we aired that, looking on YouTube, and it had like 3 million hits. And I remember calculating in my head, how long would I have needed to work at the EPA <laughs> to get three million to get responses? a similar yeah. message, yeah, to three million people <laughs> writing speeches for, you know, 40 people at a time, 30 people at a time. I, I, did, I ran the math and it was something like 600 years. It was hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of years I would have needed to work right. at EPA That's to reach funny. that same audience. So, yeah, it, 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 it is a skill to get those complicated messages to a broad audience. And yeah, Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson are two of the very best at it, aren't they? They are. And, and, you know, again, I was going to say, Bill got to start doing stand-up comedy in Seattle. And most people don't know, he won the Steve Martin lookalike contest with the arrow through the head and and, in the banjo and all that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it's like, how do people become funny? Well, a lot of practice. I mean, Bill, I mean, he's, he has, he and Neil both have the kind of personality and temperament that's, you know, that lends itself to doing comedy. But they practiced a lot. You know, Neil, you know, decided consciously, I'm going to be, I want to be a public intellectual. I want to go on TV and talk about science, particularly cosmology and so forth. And, but he, he practiced at it. That's how you do it. So I think there's some resentment mm-hmm. th- uh, for sure of that. <laughs> uh, along uh, Some other examples I know, Sag- Carl Sagan was uh, greatly resented by professional astronomers. I think the hostility is not as much as it was in Carl's time. <laughs> I actually did an analysis. I got his CV um, from his widow um, and Drian after he died, and I did this whole analysis of you know the number of times he appeared on TV, including Cosmos, The Tonight Show, and all that stuff, and then his scientific productivity, which never wavered. I mean, he had like 500 uh, peer-reviewed pu- published papers, plus all his books and plus the TV shows and all that. And so it, it, there is no a, a Sagan effect where if you become a public intellectual, your scientific productivity uh, collapses. It doesn't, n- not at all. Same thing with Steve Pinker now, you know, he's he's everywhere and he still has hundreds and hundreds of peer reviewed scientific papers and technical books and so forth. Stephen Jay Gould was resented. I mean, people hated him. You know, he's here's this, who's the paleontologist <laughs> on TV? What's he doing, you know, getting all this media attention? And again, I think it's, it's there's some envy there, just the, the inevitable result of like, why isn't it me? You know, I, I, I work hard yes. and I write books. How come I'm yeah. not on? I, I was actually thinking about this the other day, talk, uh, uh, reading about FOMO, you know, fear of missing out and faux blow, fear of being mm-hmm. left out. That apparently, you know, teenagers okay. are, are uh, you know, ramped up about. And this is part of the critique of Facebook and so on. They're, they're ruining the youth these days. <laughs> Kids these sure. days. <laughs> That's a narrative that never goes away. Yeah. <laughs> that never narrative will always away, be with no. us. <laughs> Actually, Pinker has a, a funny lecture on on language and and all this, and and, and he has so he opens with these slide quotes uh, uh, from these professors complaining bitterly about the students today, and then the date goes up. It's like seventeen sixty three at Harvard. It's like oh, <laughs> they are always complaining yeah. about the kids these days. It was it's a funny bit, but um, anyway, what was I? What was going to? Oh yeah, so. Um, uh, you know the kind of natural resentment that uh, that you can't, you feel on, like on social media. Like I follow people like Dawkins and Pinker, and these they're friends of mine, right? So I'm glad when I see them post like, "Oh, I just won this award," or "I got invited to speak at this conference," and I think, "Oh, that's so nice that Pinker got invited to 
wait a minute, how come I'm not invited to that? Yeah. You know? And then so it's like, oh, okay, yeah. this must be how people feel when they, you know, there's some party and I didn't get invited. It's the same kind of thing. I think there's, that's in human yeah. nature. I think you can't help but kind of resent some oh, of that. Oh, God, yes. What, what, what you're describing reminds me very much of the interaction between writers and performers in the TV world. It's, it's very much the same thing, especially if you've got a background in a stand-up or sketch or something, which most writers do where you think like, I, I perform, I'm on stage. Why am I not the person on camera? I'm writing it. Why am I not the person on camera? Eventually, I think you just have to come to accept being on TV. That's like a skill. Uh, there's just something to having it. What is it? No one can define what it is, but when somebody doesn't have it, you, you can see it. I know that personally I became a lot, a, a much happier person and certainly somebody who had more direction in my career when I just came to understand I'm not an on-camera guy. Why not? I don't know. I'm just not. <laughs> there's, there's a thing to being on camera and whatever it is, I don't have it, but uh, that's fine. I, I'm you know very happy writing a sub stack. That very much feels like the, the correct role for me. And uh, other people, you know, hey, they're good on camera and that's part of the skill. So look, you know, you want to be Steven Pinker, like you got to have that mad scientist hair uh, 365 days <laughs> right. a year. Malcolm that's Gladwell, right. too. He looks the <laughs> yes, way a public right. intellectual should look. They're really pulling that's it right. off. I don't know if I <laughs> could funny. have that kind of product in my hair year Maybe round stand up yeah for your next stand up you can bring out a wig or something <laughs> i'm it would a mad certainly scientist make me stand yes. out wouldn't it yeah yeah so is it is anything it, to make so yourself doing stand, I, the, doing stand up in a club would that be different than being in front of a camera in a studio yes oh very different very different two gigantic differences the first and this is something that dogged me my entire career when a comedy club has a stand-up and you know people come to see the show, typically it's just billed as comedy, which is really weird if you think about it. Venues don't just say music. They tell you what band is going to be there. Or you, right. you know well, what funny. kind of music it's going to be. It's not like, well, one night is going to be classical and then the next night it's going to be thrash mm. punk. Uh, <laughs> you know what it's going to be. And then if even if people... It, know who the headliner is because not all shows have a headliner sometimes it's just what's called a showcase but uh even if the show has a headliner that doesn't mean that the opening acts are going to be identical to the headliner in fact there's often the booker will try to mix it up a little bit so that the openers aren't identical to the headliner so it's tough walking into that situation where you have only been billed as comedy and you're going to figure out when you get on stage what type of comedy the audience likes Compare that to a TV show. Everybody knows what TV show they're seeing. They wouldn't have come to a taping. They wouldn't have, you know, queued up at three in the afternoon to get into a taping that happens at seven if they didn't know the show and like the show. So that's the first difference. And then the second difference is those audiences at TV shows, those are, they're amped up. They're ready to go. I mean, they're in there. They're excited. They, they are usually big fans of the show. And also it's an experience. I mean, I remember when I was a college kid and I uh, took a trip to L.A. and I went to see The Tonight Show. And that was like a big, fun experience. I remember the first time I went to see The Daily Show. That was a big, fun experience. I was ready to go. There's a warm-up comic. And then, you know, Jon Stewart walks out and you're, you are ready to laugh. Hey, you know, in a comedy club, <laughs> it might be a that. Thursday night. And you're looking at your watch and thinking, oh, my God, I got to get up in six hours. Can we wrap this up, please? Maybe the person you came to see has already been on and you're only sticking around to be polite. Needless to say, the enthusiasm level <laughs> is frequently lower in a comedy club. Yeah, when I did uh, the Colbert Report, it did it twice. They had, you know, a stand-up com uh, com mm. comedian warm up the crowd and the, the applause sign and all. I mean, by the time they got to me, you know, because I'm not that well known. I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye. You know, it's like, and it's Michael Sherman, and the crowd goes wild. I'm like, oh, come on, <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I can pretend that I'm really famous, and they're all so excited to see me. Most likely, they never had ever even heard of me. It's like, okay, but now in the moment, by the time the buildup, you know, every guest gets this same response. Like, wow, all right, that that does make you feel good. So, yeah, Did, yeah. 
Uh, another thing I was always curious about, like, so when you, you hear somebody say, oh, John Oliver, you should have heard him last night. He had the funniest joke. And then you, you got to be thinking, wait a minute, that was my joke. <laughs> I wrote that joke. <laughs> uh, but maybe you're, you know, you guys are all well paid enough that you think, well, that's what we do. We write the jokes and he gets the credit for them. That's right. That's right. That That's and yeah, of course, some of you thinks that. But you also you understand that is the deal. That is the deal. Um, he. It's when you write it and give it to him, it's then his joke. Um, I, I'll tell you my frustration, though, is simply that uh, now that I'm on Substack, uh, I'm an unknown on Substack. And it does frustrate me a little bit because I feel like, no, you do know my work. You just didn't know it was mine. None, none of it went under my name. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, to get the word out. I, I, one time I did a, a guest column for Matt Iglesias' Substack. Uh, which was, you know, very nice of him to rent some space out to me. And in one of the comment sections, somebody said, this sounds a lot like John Oliver. And I thought, yes, yes, it does. There's <laughs> a reason funny. for that. Yeah. Well, the Substack thing is interesting because, you know, I've just joined too. And, and it's a, I'm trying to keep up with the ever-changing media landscape. You know, when we started Skeptic in 1992, there wasn't anything like this, not even remotely. It was really still just kind of the early stages of CNN and Fox becoming big. And uh, and still really, like my first book, it was like, well, you got to get on this show and that show. There was just a few big uh, ticket items you could you could aim for, and then that was it. Now, you know what, I could do 20 podcasts to promote my book and reach the same number of people, maybe more. Or you go on like a Joe Rogan podcast where you have know, 10 million followers or whatever it is mm -hmm. now. And uh, This podcast I, has 10 I, million I, followers, doesn't it? I was told yes, it had yes, 10 that's million right. followers. That's right. Yeah. I'm just okay, 1 million good. behind you. Only, yeah. <laughs> it is the only reason I showed up. I, I do not show <laughs> up to a podcast. I see. I for see. anything fewer than, uh, yeah, that's, that's too figures. funny. Yeah. Well, I, I do think there's a, there's a Matthew effect there in all these media, you know, to those who have more shall be given to those who do not, <laughs> they'll get even less. And, and plus there's a kind of a Pareto distribution or a power law where, you know, 10% of the performers make, you know, 90% of the money whatever the industry is, you know, music or art or, or sports, professional sports and uh, writers, book writers, you know, um, you know, I, I, it's even more, it's, mo it's like 5% of the book writers make 90%, 95% of the book sales, you know, so it, there's a long mm -hmm. tail that tri tri trickles off. And I think that's probably the case with podcasts and probably the Substack thing. I, I feel like I'm maybe a little late <laughs> to get in on the early stages where you know, <laughs> Joe was at this, you know, he was just doing it. He was just screwing around while he was doing comedy and his MMA That's fighting right. commentaries and that sort of thing. And then he just grew it. You know, no one even noticed really just all of a sudden podcasts became big and he was the, you know, the top dog. So, you know, and, and I've, uh, another thing I find really weird is I, I saw in the early stages of Substack, I saw a lot of liberal writers complaining about these Substack writers are making money doing this and they're not working for the <laughs> New York Times. How is this? You know, Barry Weiss famously <laughs> left the New York Times of all places to do a Substack and she's making money, more money. It's like, wait a minute, you're one of these progressive <laughs> liberals she? that supports labor unions, right? You support labor unions. Yeah, workers should be paid properly. It's like, but not writers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They don't yeah. count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Podcasters, I think it, I think that's it's great not labor. That, <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, I think it's great that uh, people are making money. Yeah, ideally, more people could make money. It, it's a very interesting ecosystem. I, I don't. Uh, I, I never begrudge anyone who's able to make a career in entertainment because it's uh, it's hard, and if you're able to pull it off. Godspeed, you know, well, well done. You know, somebody like Joe Rogan, you know, forget your, whatever your opinions are about his podcast. You got to respect that he did, he did start from zero and sure he was, you know, he was on TV. So that's going to give you a boost. It, it will help people find it. But yeah, he did start from zero and grow the thing. You got to respect that. I, I have some, if we could talk about Substack for a second, and I hope this isn't too in the weeds for your um, listeners, but it, it's kind of an interesting thing on Substack, they have this philosophical position, which I largely agree with and I think is interesting, and yet I sometimes wonder if it's too absolutist. They don't want to become Twitter or Facebook or YouTube in that they don't want to use algorithms to recommend to their readers, hey, you should, you should look at this. 
And I totally understand that position because I do strongly believe that, let's use Twitter as the example, because I think this is the most vivid example of this. On Twitter, the way to get an audience, the way to have something go viral and get attention, it's to be as, as shouty as possible, right? It's to wade into the culture wars and pick a side and then just hammer that side's position as aggressively as you can. Pick fights, be sensationalist, be uh, combative because conflict uh, gets attention. That is the fast track, if there is a fast track, to attention on Twitter. I totally get that Substack doesn't want to be that. But I feel that they're... The fact that they don't have anything that might recommend to a reader other things they might want to read, I think it makes it difficult for readers to find things they wouldn't, uh, to find things they would like to read. Personally, I, I'd like to see two things on Substack. Number one, when you get to the end of a column, just a simple readers who enjoyed this also enjoyed, and then, yes, you know, three yes, or four I articles at the bottom. And then the. And then the second thing is, uh, I, I love Spotify, and I'm a big music fan, and I love finding bands I haven't found before, so I really like the uh, Discover Weekly thing they do on Spotify, where based on other stuff you've listened to, they give you you know a list of 20 songs, and some of them will be the Beatles, and you've heard of them, but then a lot of them will be bands you haven't heard of. I have found a lot of good bands that way. A lot of bands that are like my favorite bands now, I found them that way. I would like to see Substack do a similar thing to help people find stuff they want to find. I, well, I don't know. What are your thoughts yes, on that? Yes, we should, we should push for that. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that, but that's a good idea. I'm going to contact my, my contact there and say, we should do this. And, and there's two of us now. <laughs> yeah. And, and, two, so. and Jeff and I are going to, if you don't do this, Jeff and I are going to quit. And they're going to be going, well, bye-bye. <laughs> well, let me, yeah. first let me look up who you are. <laughs> I actually... <laughs> No, but I like yeah, you know, people I, complain about that it, that 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 algorithm on Amazon, for example. But I like that. I've discovered a ton of books that I didn't know about. You know, I'll look up some book on conspiracy yeah. theories about X, and then there's like three more I never even heard of. It's like, well, I better order those because I'm researching this topic now, and I find it quite useful. Yeah. And you know, if you get crap, you just don't click on it. <laughs> I mean, that's so what. Yeah, I'd rather yeah, have more information exactly. and, that I can select from. Yeah, no, it's true, and you know. It, you shouldn't be writing a Substack if you don't think that people would enjoy your stuff if they were able to find it. Uh, but it is tough to get people to find it. And I, I, I should reiterate that I totally understand and in a lot of ways respect the decision that Substack has made because they, they, don't, they are feeling that any time you start recommending this thing over that thing, then you are involved in it and then you are going to promote the kind of sensationalist stuff that as I described earlier, I think Twitter is ending has ended up promoting. But I do I do feel like they're kind of they're kind of forcing me to use Twitter's algorithm because the way to get attention then is through Twitter, which is probably the worst algorithm out there. I don't know. That's, those are my feelings. Well, yeah. So it remains to be seen how this is going to play out with the regulation regulatory state about to what extent uh, that Section two hundred and thirty should apply where these companies are not. Uh, publishers, so they're not accountable for what uh, appears on their platforms. And uh, because really, uh, you know, there are consequences of that and there are problems and I'm not sure what to do about it. I don't like increasing the regulatory state and breaking up Amazon or, or Google, or I guess it would be Twitter, Google, Facebook and, and so forth. I, uh, that doesn't seem right to me, but, uh, but it seems like they should have, be held accountable to a certain extent. I don't know how they would do that because you know, you say the New York Times gets maybe like a hundred submissions for op eds a day, and they pick one outside of their regular columnists. You know, so it's, but it's easy for their staff mm -hmm. to kind of go through those, and then the one they publish, they fact check it, and so on. You know, what does Facebook get postings? You know, like you know, hundred million a, an hour or something. You know, how would they ever screen those? Oh, the, it just seems. Yeah, the numbers are in, the numbers are insane. I, I forget exactly what they are, but yeah, there are. You always <laughs> hear these stats about you know, every hour, uh, you know, more content is uploaded to YouTube than, you know, I don't know, the entire history of the dinosaurs or something insane. Like <laughs> right, that. yeah, right. Exactly. But yes, it's impossible <laughs> it's impossible to screen it. It's impossible to screen it before it goes up. And by the way, uh boy, wouldn't you hate to be that person who had to watch every YouTube video <laughs> yeah, <laughs> before I know. it went up. Uh, you oh you put your head in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. 
So back to your question about, you know, what do scientists, skeptics, atheists, whatever, humanists think about the kind of stuff yeah. you're doing? Well, mostly pretty positive, I do think, that, you know, this is the kind of thing we need. We need more of it. Of course, the problem is, is that the other side, you know, say the, the climate deniers, the creationists, the Holocaust deniers, or the anti-vaxxers or something, they can do the same thing, and they do. You know, so like the number one book this week is uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book about Anthony Fauci, the real Anthony Fauci. You know, he's mm. he's he's out to murder millions of people and they want to, you know, put a chip in everybody. And Bill Gates is in, involved in, you know, in all this stuff. And it's a complete insanity. I mean, how can anybody believe this? But apparently a lot of people do. So I guess the, the, the question would be, how can we have the good stuff that you produce without the crap that's being produced on the other side that gets just amount same amount of attention, if not more. That is a great question. Does anybody know the answer to that question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please call in. <laughs> I don't yeah, think we're anyone live does. right now. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're taking calls if you know the answer to one of the most intractable <laughs> questions in the hi history of liberalism. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. The, 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 the classical liberal answer to that is that the antidote to bad speech is more good speech. I do think as, as far as broad and somewhat vague principles go, that's a pretty good one. Uh, I am, pe people really, I, I've written some about this on my sub stack. People, some people are very into deplatforming and, you know, highly curated platforms and that, you know, they want Twitter and Facebook to be more aggressive and, you know, who they kick off and what you can say. I, I am not one of those people. I feel like the the prospect of overreach is it's a very real danger. And though you are, of course, going to have to do some curation, uh, personally, I would like to see a light hand because I'm worried about overreach. And also because I don't, I just don't think we're ever going to be able to scrub nonsense off the internet. I actually, I wrote a piece specifically about this, uh, about uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Oh, I, I'm blanking on the title of the piece, but it was about uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. And the landing point is the internet as it exists now, I believe, is roughly what it's going to be. You can argue about some changes we could make around the margins. I've heard suggestions for uh, you know how stuff should be curated that I think are sane and not too problematic. But I I don't think we're ever going to have success in scrubbing bad ideas from the internet. I just don't think yeah, you can do I that. I don't think right. it works. Yeah, it, I think unless you want to have a Chinese-style total ownership and censorship of the internet, which I don't think we want, short of that, I just don't think it's possible to get bad ideas off. Yeah, it really touches on the what's called the demarcation problem in philosophy of science. How do you know what's pseudoscience? I mean, of course, I can identify right. it because I know what I think is pseudoscience, but that doesn't mean it is. And as, a, as I like to say, no one in the history of the world is ever identified as a pseudoscientist going down to their pseudo labs to collect some pseudo facts <laughs> to support their pseudo theory in the same way that no one's Everybody ever joined has that a on cult. on a business card. Is... Yeah, that's, that's right. right. No one's ever it's joined a religion. cult. Join yeah. A, yeah, yeah, they join a group that they think is going to do good and we're going to help the poor and we're going to do this and that. And, and then all of a sudden they're down in Guyana drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, how does that happen? Well, that's a different story. But so, yeah, that so, you know, like it's take someone like Alex Jones, you know, that that, you know, 90 percent of his stuff is crap. But he's not completely wrong about everything. I mean, he you know, he went in, uh, on yeah. and on about the Operation Northwoods, the you know, the plan presented to, to Kennedy of how to assassinate um, Castro and also create false flag operations to, to as a pretext to us invading Cuba. You know, like we'll dress up a, a, a an American jet to look like a Russian MiG, and then we'll buzz the Miami airport. And one of them was even like shooting down an American commercial airliner with uh, with American kids going on spring break to to Mexico, and we'll just shoot it down and blame it on the Russians or the Cubans or something. And to his credit, Kennedy said, "What are you out of your mind? We can't do that." And <clears throat> but the fact that that you know the, the the administration of American president was even thinking about that. Uh, is very telling. So when someone like Alex Jones says, you know, false, you know, Sandy Hook was a false flag operation. Okay, that's insane. But it's not like the American government has never done anything, uh, you know, like that. We we know from WikiLeaks and the Pentagon Papers and so on, you know, that yeah. the, the kind of helping to rig South American country elections so that the fascist dictator gets elected before over the 
communist dictator because the fascists are at least friendly to capitalism because they just want to make money and the communists might nationalize our company so let's help the you know the rebels get this guy elected well we did that right yeah. so it's like so yeah so, so, so if you have someone like alex jones you can't just ban him because he has some good points and so but what's the percentage okay he has to be at least 75 percent <laughs> correct you know, well who's going to measure that right and, yeah it's like it's it's like it's like purity you know you have to have uh, a certain um uh certain amount of alcoholic content to be sold as alcohol, right? You have to have a certain amount of truth content to uh, be labeled truth. Yeah, I don't know how you do that. And you're certainly, I think you chose your example very well there because certainly uh, some of the assassination plots, for example, we had against Castro is like straight up wily coyote shit with like exploding cigars and uh, other, <laughs> trying to kill him on a scuba diving trip was another plan. It's just, it's, it, it's stuff. That sounds insane, but it did in fact happen, and and yes, that's a, that's part of the reason I I don't want big tech tech companies having a heavy hand in deciding uh, what's true and what's not because I I don't think they're capable of doing that. Um, it, and also, but you're right. It this is also something I wrote about recently. This this time I do remember the title. It's uh the title of this piece was "Science Blah Blah Horseshit Is the Universal Language of COVID." You can find that on my Substack which is called I might be wrong dot com, and the it gets to this this dilemma w which you were mentioning of what do you do when stuff is a source is partly right and partly wrong and I was looking specifically at the CDC which of course is getting hammered by by the RFK junior is it R it's RFK junior who's the nutty one right who's the nutty anti-vax one okay yeah get ham hammered by his part of the political spectrum, but then also by sane people for some of the stuff they've done. And I, I wrote about two specific decisions, their early, very muddled message on whether or not you should wear a mask. And then later on, uh, Dr. Fauci said uh, he, 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 he had been sort of misrepresenting the number of people who would need to get vaccinated or the percentage of the population that would need to get vaccinated in order to reach herd immunity. And he said he was doing that because he didn't want people to think it was okay to not get vaccinated. So I think, I think that was a bad thing to do because when you lose a bit of your credibility like that, then it opens the door for the RFK juniors of the world to jump in and say, aha, he was fudging that. So certainly you can't believe him on anything. And I think that's a gigantic problem, and especially as somebody who used to work in the federal government. I think, you know, people have to, the, people in positions of authority have to realize their credibility. It's not kind of important. It's extraordinarily important. And they should really value that above most other things because it allows them to speak with authority and does, you know, shut the door to the RFK juniors and the Alex Joneses of the world, helps them from, uh, you know, getting, uh, putting their roots down in people's brains, right? Yeah, exactly. This last summer, I was at Freedom Fest in, uh, at the Mount Rushmore. You know, Freedom Fest is this kind of libertarian conference. It's pretty big, about 2,000 people go. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say they're, they're, they're far right or anything like that. More, more libertarian, I guess. Anyway, one of the spe speeches, of course, this was a, a subject of, you know, Anthony Fauci, masks. Libertarians don't like mandates of anything, right? So... Of course, that was a, a of course not. popular subject. So somebody, one of the a lot speakers, of them don't like driver's licenses. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I know. Yeah, I mean, sovereign citizens. Now, there's a conspiracy theory, right? I mean, they think <laughs> that the, there is no United States. It's not even a country. It's this corporate. It's like a Delaware corporation, and they never actually ratified the constitution. They go on and on. It's crazy, right? So I've honestly never heard that are, one, but just, it sounds fun. I'll look it oh, up. Oh yeah. Oh no. <laughs> no no. It's I, I'll tell. I, I write about this. I have a whole chapter on this in my next book on conspiracies because I got involved in one of these cases where. Well, let me back up. So it's a funny story. When I was at Pepperdine University as an undergraduate, um, we got a little notice on our door or whatever uh, that uh, there was this seminar you could go to about how you don't have to actually pay income tax. So um, me and my roommate, we went to this seminar, just in you know, a local hotel or whatever. And this guy walked through for like an hour about how, you know, the, the 13th Amendment, which are, no, the 11th Amendment, which everyone ratified um, the t uh, income tax. Uh, was never properly ratified. Congress never approved it and on and on and on. And so you don't actually have to do this. 
And here's what you do when they send you that form, you know, the, when you don't, when you don't file, you'll get a letter and then here's your response. And then you'll get another letter, another letter. Eventually they're going to want to come to your house. Here's how you handle it. And you'll never again have to pay income tax. And I thought, this can't be true. If this was true, no one would pay income tax. I mean, no one <laughs> likes paying income tax. And there's people smarter than me that would, you know, check this out and say, oh my God, it's true. So, you know, and then, then it would be a new story, right? My buddy's like, no, no, this is it. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm never paying taxes again. And he didn't for like 15 years and they finally caught up with him anyway. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I was a, uh, hired as a expert witness in a case one of these sovereign citizen cases where the guy didn't pay income tax, but he had this, he had this other thing, this OID 1099 form you can file in which you, if you have investments, particularly real estate investments, you can depreciate them in the going forward in the future. I may be getting this wrong at this point, but something like you can depreciate them going forward in the future and then take the tax deduction now and actually even get a refund if you fill it out correctly. And so this guy did this and he actually got like a $700,000 check from the IRS as a refund for, for, for money he never paid. And it was just this kind of complex depreciation thing. And he thought, well, if I got away with that, so the next year he filed for like one and a half million dollar refund check and the IRS said, wait a minute. <laughs> anyway, he ended up <laughs> you know, going to jail for this, but turns out he was a sovereign citizen and he had a whole thing about, you know, the United States is not actually a country and and the 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 unit the political unit is the individual you are a sovereign citizen you are your own country and so therefore if the police pull you over cuz you, you don't have a license plate or you don't have your driver's license they check that it, it doesn't matter they can't do anything about it well you, well yes they can cuz they have the gun yes, they can. and you don't <laughs> well so one response by the sovereign citizens is well i'm going to get a gun because if they have a gun, then oh, I should have a gun. No, and then no, you get the, the whole no. Second Amendment thing. And, the, and and these people actually believe this. I mean, I got the reason I was an expert witness was, was the defense was he actually believed it. It wasn't a con game just to make money, although, of course, that was part of it. But he actually believed this stuff. So uh, there's an example of, um, you know, conspiracy theories that actually have consequences. I mean, people go to jail for this sort of thing. And uh, and there's been a few shootings, you know, shootouts with cops, you know, like you don't have the right to pull me over and then they they take off and the cop chases them down and then, you know, they each have guns. And, you know, when you have hotheads like that, it's you know, not a good outcome. I forget how we got off on that story that, we were talking about. You, you were going to tell me, well, and first let me say that I, I, I do think that is a theory, the sovereign citizen thing, that's a theory that is not going to field test well, and no. I hope people <laughs> don't try to take it into the field. I, I also uh, am picturing people uh, in a shootout with the cops, you know, yelling uh, theory back and forth, you know, somebody, uh, you know, quotes Thomas Paine and the, you know, the cop yells back Kant or something like that. Uh, <laughs> Right. I, I I don't think that's, that's gonna. Funny. I just don't think that's gonna go well. I, I, it makes me very <laughs> right. sad. But yes, you're gonna tell me something about uh, you were at uh, a conference at Mount Rushmore. Oh, that's right. Happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Freedom Fest. So this uh, writer was talking about uh, Anthony Fauci and, uh, and no, not, so, sorry. So he was talking about Anthony Fauci today and the masks and vaccines and so on. He goes, "Let me tell you a story. I was on the beat covering the AIDS epidemic back in the late '80s, and there was a." a journal article in Nature, you know, the most prestigious and so on and so forth. And and the article said that AIDS can be um, transmitted to other people through the air and through water. And, you know, so you, can, you, should, you should be careful on the bus and whatever, you know, crowd, crowds and so on. And then we have to socially isolate, you know, on and on and on. And that uh, and, and then it turned out that wasn't true. And then they published a retraction. And the author of this paper was none other than Anthony Fauci. And everyone in the room just erupts. Oh, of course, this guy. He's always flip-flopping and changing his mind. And I'm like, hang on. So at the moment that he published this paper, this was what people thought. AIDS could be transmitted other than just through blood transfusions or, or sex. And, uh, and, and then they realized that was wrong. So he issued a retraction. What's wrong with that? That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but to this crowd, it was like, you're a flip-flopper. You know, you, the moment you yeah. speak and give a conclusion, then you have to stick with that no matter what. It's like, no, that's not the yeah. right way to think about this. 
Yeah, well, I mean, obviously they're yeah they're primed to dislike him and primed to they, they've already got this this narrative that they want to believe is true, right? That uh, Doctor Fauci is evil, and they want to believe that they busted him. You know, it's right. right. Yeah, it's you right. know, kind of. I was talking about television and what plays well on tel- television. That you know, you're busted, beat. Like, oh, that's a lot of fun. I mean, sixty minutes has been doing that for what seventy years now. It's a lot of fun. So yeah. You're busted, Anthony Fauci. Is a that's a lot. That's a very fun reveal for that particular audience. And I suppose if he had written the paper in like 2016, that would really be something. But I assume <laughs> yeah, right. it was several decades prior to that. Yeah, and there's this uh, lack of of goodwill toward people like him. I mean, it, it, it to me, he kind of exudes integrity. Like I'm trying to do the best I can with what we know today. And even mm-hmm. if he's wrong, or like on the mask thing, where he apparently was a little uh, dissembling about not using masks because of the need of first responders to have the masks in the healthcare. Yeah, they were uh, trying to they were trying to make sure people didn't buy them all up and people couldn't yeah, get them in hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Which which which, yeah. which was happening with toilet paper. So why not masks? Okay, so you know he probably shouldn't have done that. You know he lied. Okay, yeah, all right, he lied. Call it whatever you want, but it wasn't like he's doing this to control people or because now the, the, the the interpretation is they, they, whoever they is, the governor of California here, Newsom, he just wants to control the, you know, the, uh, the population. Uh, That isn't the impression I get at all. I don't particularly like Newsom, but I I don't get the impression he wants to control me. I I think if I was a politician or a policymaker and you stick a mic in my uh, face and go, okay, you have to tell us what we're supposed to do. We're restaurant owners. What, what do we do? Well, I don't know. I guess I'm going to err on the side of caution because if I'm responsible yeah. and there's this massive outbreak and half your customers die, you're going to come back to me and say, how come you didn't enforce the mask rule? Right. So I'm going to err on the side of caution, the precautionary principle, probably just in case, even though I'm not that person. So I'd rather, you know, not have it uh, go on that, on that side. I'd rather just, you know, let's just all get vaccinated and lead our lives. But not you know giving some credit to the people that have to make those decisions. It doesn't seem obvious that that they're trying to control this. It's not a power thing. It it, it seems like a silly narrative to me. It is awfully conspiratorial. To yes, control. Yeah, maybe you don't like their decisions. Maybe you think they were poor decisions. Okay, I'd certainly listen to that. But yeah, control is awfully silly. I became, um, you know, extraordinarily skeptical of big time government conspiracy theories when I worked in the federal government for a long time. Cause I realized two things. Number one, most people who work for the federal government, they're doing their best. They're smart people who are doing their best. They're certainly not infallible. Government makes mistakes all the time. I write about them a fair amount. <laughs> government makes mistakes. It happens, but they're good people doing their best. And, but then the second thing is there's a certain amount of just sort of institutional dumbassery that comes with being part of any large organization that, makes large-scale conspiracy impossible. Like, people talk about the government hiding aliens. I'm like, we couldn't get the hang of two-sided printing in my office. <laughs> like, we're not That's working funny. on nanotechnology. <laughs> the reply right. versus reply all function in email is kicking our ass right now. Baby steps. <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah, the joke but is anyway, Clinton couldn't even... Clinton couldn't even get a blowjob in the White House without the world knowing how are they hiding the aliens <laughs> or whatever else they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's true. It's a solid point. <laughs> one of my examples I use, my, one of my favorite episodes of Joe Rogan's podcast with uh, Edward Snowden, where, you know, Joe's really into conspiracy theories. Right. So he's kind of nudging uh, right. Snowden along that down that path. And, and Snowden says, you know, let, let me tell you what, what's really going on here, Joe. And it's like, ooh, okay. He goes, it's not cigarette smoking <laughs> men and behind closed doors. It's just a bunch of bureaucrats trying to keep their jobs and their little fiefdom. Like, we, this is our budget. <laughs> we want to increase our budget next year. We all want to give ourselves a pay raise and hire this guy and hire that person and so on and grow our department. Now, what do we got to do? Well, you know, if if we've solved the problem of of terrorism and it's no longer the threat that it used to be because we're so effective, well, what's going to happen to our budget? Well, we got to ramp up the, you know, code red. We are on the you know, the, the brink of the terrorists attacking us again. So you need us, right? So it's kind of a sec- yeah. security theater played out, but not for evil reasons, just guys trying to keep their jobs, right? And, and their little there, fiefdom. The, there is uh, a, a certain amount of that. I mean, everyone in the federal government knows. I mean, 
I've already spoken openly about my experiences in television. So one of my experiences in uh, the federal government was, uh, yes, you never go before Congress and say, hey, look, you know what? We got more money than we need. <laughs> Why don't, you should really give us less. You give us less money. We don't, we, it's just sitting in stacks in the corner. We don't know what to do with it. You certainly never do that. Uh, you do want to perpetuate your existence. The good news is people in Congress know that. Like They know the game, too. A, a yeah, smart yeah, member yeah, of Congress of like gets it and is not just going to keep throwing money at you. I did hear the craziest iteration, though, of the like it, every conspiracy theory, like there's a nugget of truth, and then they just extrapolate and extrapolate and extrapolate until it becomes completely insane. For one of my pieces on my Substack, I watched Tucker Carlson's Patriot Purge. Do you know of this thing that's on? Uh, yeah, oh God, indeed. And I'll tell you, it delivers on its promise to be one of the craziest things you've ever seen. Because this is the one, it's not even, Fox News deemed it too weird for Fox News. It's on like the Fox News streaming service. And the theory there is that the January 6th storming of the Capitol was a false flag operation put on by, it's not, it's not exactly clear by whom, it's another they. It's the same they that popped up in the dialogue you were talking about earlier. They engineered January 6th because the war on terror is over and they need to justify their existence now. So yes, I guess this would be the part of the Venn diagram where Tucker Carlson and Edward Snowden <laughs> come together. It's it's just the it's actually it's worth a watch <laughs> or you could just read it about it on my Substack. It is an absolutely bonkers uh hour and a half of television. Isn't some of the well one of it is that they is, is at least some of them Antifa and that they were sprinkled in amongst yep. the Trump supporters, or maybe they were all Trump supporters, or, or all Antifa That's... dressed as Trump supporters. To which I responded when I first heard that, I responded, so uh, how about this? All the Antifa people dressed in black masks and in their uh, pseudo-military um, garb in Seattle and Portland, those are actually all Trump supporters dressed as Antifa. <laughs> that's, just, that's just as non-falsifiable as yours. It Everyone, everyone is an agent provocateur, but, <laughs> right. but for, but for the other side, right. you're right. All the, all the proud boys are actually Antifa and all the Antifa are actually <laughs> proud boys. <laughs> right. Yeah. That is the, that is the theory that it, that is part of the theory. Their evidence for that is they're like, this one guy was there that day. That's the proof that <laughs> right. they have as right. if, right. as if we didn't know from the people who have been arrested in the thousand Facebook profiles that have been found that we didn't, as if we don't know that like. Yeah, the people, they were Trump supporters. Of course they were. Uh, and uh, briefly, and you know, we could talk for hours about uh, <laughs> Tucker Carlson's Patriot Purge, but and we won't. But one thing I do want to mention about the theory, part of the theory is that uh, they say the left went easy on the... Antifa protesters in the summer of 2020, the, you know, things stemming from George Floyd protests, because they went easy on them because they wanted to trick the right wing protesters into thinking it would be okay to storm the Capitol, that they could get away with it. Which, first of all, it's like a second ago, wait, a second ago you said it was Antifa. Now you're saying it's not Antifa. And also they would have had to be time travelers to, to do that. But this is kind of the level that that theory, theory is uh, operating on. I, I have not seen this film yet. Is George Soros in there somewhere in the formula? <laughs> Behind the scenes, paying for all these protesters? He he's in a different one on the Tucker Carlson channel. Uh, so yes, good guess. Um, but no, he's not in Patriot Purge, but he's in one of the other Tucker Carlson ones. So the bottom line for it, I haven't seen this film yet. So at the end, it's that this was a <laughs> false flag opera. That's the it's definitive. And That's or is the it just, I'm just, or is it just, I'm asking questions, the, you know, the so, so-called jacking up. Yeah, I'm just asking questions. The, the latter, just asking questions, just asking yeah. questions. Because of course they I mean, can't prove it, so yeah, do they, that they leave all it in the time. that gray area. Yeah, the 9-11 truthers do that all the time. Whenever I engage with them, they're saying, look, I'm not sick because I say, well, then who do you think did it? Who exactly in the Bush administration? Name names. Who did Bush tell to plant right. the explosive? To well, I'm not saying I know who it is. I'm just asking questions. Like, right. yeah, okay. Right. Same thing with the JFK, you know? All right, yeah. so if it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald or it was him and somebody else, who's the somebody else? Oh, you know, they, the FBI, the KGB. Well, who? The FBI is a pretty big place. Who? Mm -hmm. Name some names. Oh, well, we don't know. I'm just asking questions about this anomaly. You know, Kennedy's head did this one thing here. <laughs> back and to the left. Back and to the left, you know? And so, yes. Yeah. And, 
<laughs> well, it makes yeah, it makes politics it, more fun, doesn't it? When you can just throw throw shit out and never have to actually prove any of it. Well, you know, there's whole web pages dedicated to Oliver Stone's movie JFK. You know, like the 237 things that he lied about or made up or exaggerated, and there are a lot. Even that famous scene, you know, with Kevin Costner with the jury back and to the left, back and to the left, so, back and to the left. You know, yeah, there, sure. If you actually look at, you go online on YouTube right now and just put, put in, you know, Zabruder film slow motion, and you can see the headshot. It's at frame 213, 313, uh, in which the brain matter goes that way, forward, up and forward, because the bullet came from behind. And it's like not back into the left, you know, so the, the, the head kind of goes boom like that, you know, which is exactly what's supposed to happen from a shot from behind. But no one ever, you know, the, you know, Oliver Stone's never responded to that saying, yeah, okay, that, uh, we got that one wrong. You know, that's part of the problem there is you, know, you just throw shit out like 200 things and see what sticks. And, and the power of film <laughs> is so, it, it, it's so uh, powerful. When I saw, I, I hadn't really thought much about the JFK assassination business until I saw that film. And I thought, you know, this something is here. Yeah, he's on to something. Even if only like half of what he said is true, there is a conspiracy. And then, you know, I started reading these, you know, the blogs first and then articles, you know, I'm like this is wrong and this and this and this. I thought, OK, never mind. <laughs> you know, this is it's probably all. Bullshit. Yeah, I, I had a, I had a similar experience in that that movie came out. Uh, well, certainly it was in this will date me. It, it was in the video store when I worked in a video store during high school. And I remember <laughs> putting it on the video tape. store, which I absolutely should. I, I should not <laughs> have been putting that on in, in the video store and like watching it in the. <laughs> On yeah. the TVs in the video store because there's a lot of right. they show there's a Pruder film in that they're like five year olds. What yeah. was I doing? Why wasn't I yeah. fired? But at any rate, <laughs> at any rate, I did watch it in the video store as like a 17 year old, and I did think, whoa, whoa, yeah, I can't believe it. But then I had a similar experience. You know, you get older and you and you start to realize that um the the salacious and uh you know, highly conspiratorial stuff that you hear in politics. It's a lot of fun, but it's usually not true. I read more about it and found out, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's not, uh, probably not true. And um, not that I ever got very into the, you know, JFK conspiracy, but I certainly did learn that Oliver Stone is not to be your authoritative source on that issue. Um, but it, at least, you know, going through that process and that period of my life does help me understand why you know people are drawn to this type of thing it certainly does make politics a lot more interesting a lot more fun it's just it's fun it's a fun narrative because look that was a good movie <laughs> none of it was true but it was a good movie it was an interesting movie it did well at the box office i think it did maybe won some awards or something so uh as as a piece of entertainment it succeeded right yeah most so much of politics is boring. I mean, I, my guess is your work at the EPA was mostly just bureaucratic boredom and paperwork. And oh, that's God, yes. who cares about that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that there's a grand conspiracy that they don't want us to know about the aliens or whatever. Uh, yeah. So like, for example, in that movie, Stone makes a, a has his character say something about uh, Oswald shot Maggie's drawers when he was in the army, which means he couldn't hit the side of the barn, much less be a, a, tar a, a, a sharpshooter. Well, Gerald Posner tracked down his military record and then showed his rifle retraining. And then he scored the second highest you can get. He was a marksman. And then if you go to Dealey Plaza, you can go up to the sixth story, sixth floor of the book depository building. You look right out the window and they have two X's in the street, the neck shot through the neck and then the head shot. And you could see, oh my God, it's just right there. I mean, I could, I don't have any experience shooting rifles and I bet I could hit it, right? It's, it's, Close. So, you know, that's, that, that's just a lie. He, he, you know, he lied about that. Or another one is that, yeah. uh, what are the chances that Oswald would have a job on the parade route that Kennedy would be going right by the building where he happened to work? Well, the, the fact is, again, Posner checked this down. He got the job there, you know, like two months before the, the parade route was even determined or that Kennedy was even going to Dallas to give a speech. So much of the world turns on these kind of quirky chants experiences but the mind doesn't grasp yeah. randomness very well it's like th they can't be random that has to be somebody made that happen right and uh but yeah no. <laughs> but the, but the, but yeah, they have to I, I, track, I think... track it down is boring and you know just kind of tedious it's not exciting yeah i 
th- definitely that thing about thinking all coincidences must be set up somehow. Uh, I, I'm a baseball fan, and one of the fun things about baseball is, you know, it, over the course of two months, three months, something insane, you know, involving the team that you like is going to happen. You know, somebody's going to hit uh, two home runs in an inning, or there's going to be a triple play, or, you know, somebody the, so, somebody will do something weird, uh, and they'll look it up, and they'll say, wow, that hasn't happened since 1921. And you'll think, God, what are the what are the odds of that? And it's true that the odds of, you know, whatever the weird anomaly was, the unassisted triple play or anything like that, it's like the odds of that are astronomical. But the odds of something like that happening over the course of a baseball season, the odds of something like that happening are very high. It's just you don't know which which weird thing the weird thing is going to be. Yeah, that's right. If you set out ahead of time and said, okay, what are the odds that a unassisted triple play will happen today at today's game? Well, pretty much yeah. zero, close to zero, right? But after it happens, mm-hmm. then you go, oh, okay. So uh, that's the law of large numbers. Just have enough stuff going on. You know, 340 million Americans, you're getting, you know, million to one odds will happen 340 times a day, however you want to figure that. But that's right. So, so much of conspiracies, theory, real conspiracies hinge on these kind of quirky chance events. I write about the assassination of Franz Ferdinand that launched the First World War. I called it the you know, the deadliest conspiracy theory in history. You know, that this was a real conspiracy. This was a group of Serbian nationalists that were unhappy about the Austro-Hungarian Empire and and in their relationship with Serbia. So they wanted to break away. And so they thought, well, we'll assassinate Franz Ferdinand when he's here because he's the heir to the throne. And they had, you know, like seven different assassins and they were plotted along the uh, parade route, which was published in the newspaper. And, you know, it's a convertible car, so we can get him, no problem. But then, you know, like the one one guy, he, he went to the door to give the secret password and no one answered. Another guy chickened out. Another guy was too late. And then the, the one guy threw the hand grenade and he missed and it bounced off the car and went under this other car. And then the whole thing blew up and, and then they gave up because they missed him. Anyway, then this guy, Franz Ferdinand, goes to the hospital to check on the people that were hurt. And then they decide to, to, to not give the speech they're going to give. And then they're going to go back along the parade route to go to this uh, this other hospital where somebody else was injured. And they and the driver takes him on the exact same parade route, and then he makes a right turn and realizes it's a one-way street and, and it's going the wrong way. So he, there's no reverse in the car. This is so weird. So he, he kind of puts it in neutral, lets the car drift back. And there on the corner is this guy, uh, Gabriel uh, Gab, Gabriel Princip. And he's got mm-hmm. his rifle. He's got his his pistol in his pocket and he's eating a sandwich because he's despondent like well this was a failed day and there's the prince i mean there's the franz Ferdinand, the you know air right there in front of him like five feet away he's like oh fuck it bam <laughs> purely <laughs> randomness right there you know there's it was a conspiracy but that's kind of normally how it goes right you know people are incompetent bad yeah. luck bad timing you know, just like Watergate. I mean, you know, Nixon administration, most powerful administration in the entire world ever in U.S. history and so on. And they couldn't even break into, a, you know, the Democratic headquarters without getting caught. You know, his top C- his yeah. top FBI G-men, you know, G. Gordon Liddy. They, yeah, couldn't, they couldn't even get away the with it. The, they had to, right, they had right. to tape, the, uh, tape the door shut, right? Or that tape <laughs> yeah, the, right. the, the catch on the door. And that's what ultimately got him caught. Yeah. Right. That's right. But yes, I forgot al- about that. Yeah. It, it also, uh, it, it really... <laughs> really highlights the um the randomness of things doesn't it that uh there's no think history doesn't have to go the way that it goes you're right if he doesn't take the wrong turn down the alley and then try to throw the car in reverse uh then world war one doesn't start at least it doesn't start right then that's for sure i i you know it's funny i had heard that story before i hadn't heard the detail about the sandwich so thank you very much for telling me about that. <laughs> yeah, and went to this telling you about the and... detail of the sandwich because now, yes, because now I picture World War One starting with <laughs> Gorilla <Subway> Princep <laughs> with a pistol in one hand, yes, and a big sloppy meatball sub in the other hand. <laughs> and, that, and then the way I'm picturing it, he's also trying to not drop the sub because after he kills our yeah, two right. Ferdinand, he does still want to eat the sandwich. <laughs> so right. he's trying to kind of balance the two things. There's a stand-up bit for your next uh, in-person improv. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Or I think a sketch because you'd need to see him. You need to see him trying to not drop right. the sub. And maybe he, oh, yeah. maybe he kills Archduke Ferdinand but drops the sub, and he is pretty disappointed because <laughs> yes. he didn't oh, want to no. eat that sandwich. And now I got to take the poison. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. So, you know, there's research on the fact that the human mind is not well geared to understand randomness, you know, the gambler's fallacy. Well, I've gotten, you know, five reds in a row or, you know, or, or whatever. So, you know, black is due as if the dice have, you know, the roulette wheel has memory like, oh, we've got to correct the, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the, the cosmic averages or something like that it just doesn't work that way. And, uh, or, you know, the, another story is, you know, when, uh, jobs introduced the, uh, random shuffle feature for the iPod, you know, customers were complaining. It's not random. Certain songs come up a, a more over and over and others don't hmm. come up at all. That's randomness. You know, you'll, you know, on a, on, on a coin flip model, it, it isn't, you know, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. It's like heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, 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 tails, tails, you know, there's clustering. Right. So clustering effects mm-hmm. make people think, well, there's a pattern. There's something underlying, yep. you know, this pattern. I got to look for it like cancer clusters, uh, you know, famously uh, get people to look for corporations that are, you know, in the nearby neighborhood where there's this cancer cluster and they must be poisoning the air or water. Not necessarily. Sometimes, you know, it's like the stars in the sky are clustered into constellations. That's randomness. You know, if every star was perfectly Mm -hmm. aligned with the same amount of space between every star in the sky, that that would not be random. There'd be something, you know, God's behind the whole thing or something like that. (laughs) And uh, so, again, you know, it's uh, it's inevitable that, you know, in in much of life, it's just random. But the mind, you know, connects the dots. Okay, so this happened and that happened. Then he did this and that. There must be something behind it. Yeah. Another another baseball analogy. Like 10 years ago, people figured out that if you call for nine fastballs in a row, the batter's not ready for that. Because once you've thrown three, they'll think, okay, he's thrown three. He's going to throw me a curveball now. But no, if you throw nine in a row, you can. Uh, that, that is a form of randomness. And again, the baseball world knows this now. But there was a time uh, not too long ago that, yeah, people thought random. Fastball, curveball, changeup. Fastball, curveball, changeup. That's random, right? It's like, no, random might be nine fastballs in a row. Yeah. Right, I, like with uh, pa- I, I paper, wonder- rock, scissors. If you if you give the same sequence every time, you can be hacked by the your opponent and, and lose every time. I wanted to ask you, said, are you, you you must be a baseball fan? You know, one of my favorite movies is Moneyball. But I got to thinking, you know, in a game theoretic model, if everybody did Moneyball, then there'd be no advantage to it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why the Oakland A's aren't good anymore because everyone ripped them off, and. Uh, <laughs> Everyone ripped them off and everyone uses their, uh, their methods. I should, I should point out, by the way, for anyone who's watching the, uh, video version of this, I, I am wearing my Seattle Mariners t-shirt Oh, that says okay. maybe, maybe next year on it. <laughs> that's um, really funny. Cause <laughs> that's, they, they yeah, that's the, a lot of the, being a Mariners fan. It become the Chicago Cubs of the West coast. <laughs> oh, well, it, we, we, we presently have the longest drought um, from the playoffs in, in any major sport, not in baseball. The team that has gone the longest without making the playoffs is the Seattle Mariners. But I'm really? loyal, and I lived near Seattle for a while when I was a kid, so I'm sticking with the Mariners. But uh, I, I bring that up to say that, uh, yeah, the, y- you're exactly right that you do lose the comparative advantage because in the movie Moneyball, the good guys are the Oakland A's and the bad guys are the Seattle Mariners. I'll tell you that the team the A's were catching that year was the Mariners. And I wasn't oh, happy no. about it. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it, funny. Was, it was a really rough time. We had Ichiro. We had Jamie Moyer. We were good back then. But the A's caught us because the A's were super smart. But yes, that was 20 years ago. And with time, everyone else in baseball has become pretty darn smart. And we're all using the Oakland A methods. And that's why fi- finally, 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 teams like the Mariners are catching up to the A's simply because we're, we started doing things their way. The, the 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 next the next money ball is going to have to be somebody figuring out some new comparative advantage and you know right yes, whoever does right. that is going to be rich to, right you have to stay one step ahead of everybody else whatever that is if I knew what it was I'd do it <laughs> right so exactly all right Jeff we're coming up on almost two hours here let me uh, and I got a hard out coming up so let me just ask you uh, since the title of your uh, show or sorry your Substack column is uh, I might be wrong so what have you been wrong about. Oh, great question. Uh, first, let me say it's it's uh, my Substack, and there's also a podcast version. So if you don't oh, know how right, to yeah. read, yeah. there's also <laughs> there's also a podcast. <laughs> what have I been wrong it. about? It, <laughs> there's so there's so many things. That's why I named it. I might be wrong. Also, because it's a Radiohead song, and I like Radiohead a lot. Um, I'm certainly at the age where. <laughs> 
I think one reason to be open minded is because you get old enough. I'm 41, so I'm just old enough that I can look back at myself when I was younger, but still an adult, and I just realize, oh God, I've been wrong about a lot of things. So I better have some intellectual humility because odds are I'm wrong about stuff now. I just don't know which stuff it is. I would say one, definitely one of the formative experiences in my life was I was one of these liberals that was wrong about the Iraq war. I was, so I was 23 when the war was launched. You know, I was a temp. Nobody was really asking me for my opinion. So I, I wouldn't exactly say my fingerprints were on that war. But uh, I was a person who was interested in politics, and I was following this stuff, and I had studied it in school. And if you had asked me on the day that the invasion started, should we do this or should we not, I would have said, yes, we should do this. I, had, I didn't like the way the Bush administration did things in the run-up to the war. I, you know, I knew some of the intelligence was shaky. I knew that we didn't have many allies with us. But for reasons of principle, because I did think Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction, and I did think they had been thumbing their nose at the UN. So sort of for enforcement reasons, to enforce the UN resolutions, I would have said, yes, do it. And my God, that was just completely the wrong call. The The right thing to do would have been to muddle through, because we now know that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program was just, you know, an aspiration. They just kind of would like to have them someday, but they had no direct path of getting there. Muddle through as opposed to starting that war and then all the consequences that came from that. And, you know, obviously it was just ugly, ugly, ugly. So that was an experience that I had early in life that made me think, be less certain, be less certain about. Yeah. What you and think, and you most know. Democrats, most Democrats voted for it. Wasn't there just one dissent? Um, I forget her name now. Well, that, that was the uh, Afghan, that was the Afghan war. That was the Afghan. Oh, the Afghan said that's the, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Authorization of the Iraq war was uh, uh, more Democrats were against it than for it, but many were for it, including uh, like John Kerry, who then got the nomination in 2004. And then, of course, Hillary Clinton, who was in the Senate at the time. So, yeah, a not a, a not unsubstantial number of Democrats voted to authorize it. And I would have been one of them if I had been in Congress and not a 23 year old temp at an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but as is appropriate, right. I had no power at that time. So. <laughs> right. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. If you were a terrorist, like Osama bin Laden spent $500,000 on 9-11, and we spent $2 trillion in response. If you're looking at that, you're going to think, that's a pretty good deal. We, you know, he succeeded. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's do something like that. Right? The, uh, the econometrics yeah. of terrorism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, we did. All right. What else have you been wrong about? What else? Boy, I, th I feel like I gave a really, really that's good, a good one. No, one. that's a good one. Now, yeah, I've been thinking about things like abortion, immigration. Uh, you know, I, a lot of these don't have correct answers, though, right? I mean, like the Iraq war, that seems pretty clear. Yeah. You know, we, you can make a decision about that. Others I see as more like political truths that don't have empirical answers to them. You know, like when does life begin? What's the right percentage of immigrations yeah. that, uh, immigrants we should allow in? There, it seems like, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. It's like, this is what I believe now, and here's my arguments, but I don't know. Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you two, because I did call my Substack I might be wrong, so I should be able to, yeah, summon many <laughs> things I was wrong about. More than about. one. <laughs> but, <laughs> so again, like, Iraq War, that's a biggie. I was real wrong about that. Um, I was on uh, Team Transitory when it came to inflation. I read about economics a fair amount on my blog. I was, I, I was on Team Transitory, and Team Transitory is not looking great. I continue to be what is not that? I panicked what about that... inflation. Oh, oh okay. To, there, there was, you know, six, six, eight months ago, there was a question of, is the inflation that we're starting to see, is that just temporary, or is it going to be with us for a while? I, and I, I, I continue to, you know, as I just said, I'm not too worried about inflation, but it's absolutely on my radar. And, you know, I'm not an economist. I always say I'm an economist. I study it in school. <laughs> I don't hold a PhD in it. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I don't want to, you know, uh, claim that I know more than I do. But definitely the predictions that I made or would have made if I had been talking at length about this six to eight months ago would have been less correct than the predictions of somebody like Lawrence Summers, who was, you know, probably more right than wrong, it turns out, in that particular discussion. So that's on my radar. That's the thing I was wrong about. And here's 
This is a kind of obscure one, but I was just thinking about this the other day. I used to be not quite an absolutist when it came to legacy admissions in colleges, in that I don't like legacy admissions. I was mostly against them, but I did hear the argument of people who would say, you know, this really does help with fundraising, the whole legacy admissions idea. It Number one, it helps with fundraising quite a bit. And number two, college admissions, there's a lot of gray area and you get a lot of candidates who they certainly they could succeed in the school. The margins between the person we're going to admit and the person we're not going to admit are they're very thin. And it comes down to it's like, how do you rate, you know, being an Eagle Scout versus being a virtuous with the violin? Like, how do you compare those two things? It's it's such a gray area that when you have multiple candidates in that gray area, maybe just give it to the person who also comes with a $10 million donation that we can then use to, yeah, that we can then use to, you know, do things like give a scholarship to, you know, a poor student, or we could blow it on a building we don't need. Who knows? But they come with money. I used to be sympathetic to that argument. I used to be less of an absolutist about legacy admissions. I have become an absolutist about legacy admissions and that I just say, just don't do them. Just get rid of them. Uh, because I feel that the effect, the 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 unfairness, the corrosiveness, I, I just feel that effect is so strong that it outweighs the arguments about, you know, it, helping with fundraising and things like that. I understand that's a, yeah, doing that's away a with legacy example. admissions would, would be bad for fundraising, but I just say, okay, take that hit because the corrosive effect is just too big. Yes, I think most issues are like that. They're complex enough. You'd have to at least write a long blog about it because there are usually other sides to the question that, that and that gets us back to where we began. Like, how do we, uh, you know, deal with the post-truth, alternative facts, fake news world? Well, more nuanced thinking and conversation mm -hmm. about and acknowledging the other side, they actually have some pretty good arguments and I'm going to see if I can steel man them, even though I don't agree with them. And that's hard to do. So... Well, that's a good mm -hmm. place to wrap it up, Jeff. Uh, I have a meeting. I got a Zoom meeting with the Illuminati. We're deciding whether we're going to let Putin invade Ukraine <laughs> or not. So this is kind of big. I got to give this some thought. <laughs> I got to make my vote. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, sure. Plus, you got to change into the robe and the uh, the, the yeah, special oh, yeah, clothes yeah, and yeah. get to the that's center right. of the volcano right. where the Illuminati I got a, meets. I got, so. a, I got yeah. a hood and a vest. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm number 13 in the Illuminati. I was just added last year. It was a great Oh, is honor. that right? Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. That's a good number. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Thanks for well, coming hey, thanks on. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of Big fun to fun. talk to you.